I'm reading today from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. This is volume three. And like volumes one and two, this book is full of new facets of Dr. Jung's Red Book. I wanted to particularly, because I've been communicating with Dr. Paul Vanderclay, the Reverend Paul Vanderclay, about Dr. Jung's work, I do want to read one place where Dr. Jung did refer to the metaphysical, and this appears in Murray Stein's essay in this book entitled Jung's Red Book as a New Link in the Aurea Catania. I'm just reading a portion of Dr. Stein's essay because I think it's so important for our discussion. The Transmission of Spirit in Tradition. To begin, I reach back to a somewhat obscure source, to one of Jung's earliest pieces, his fifth and last Zofingian lecture, given in January 1899, titled Thoughts on the Interpretation of Christianity with reference to the theory of Albrecht Ritchell. In that lecture, which he delivered to his fraternity brothers at the University of Basel and composed in the year before he took up residency in psychiatry in Zurich, Jung displays his interest in theology. He boldly criticizes some of the views expressed by the important liberal Protestant theologian Albrecht Ritchell. 1822 to 1889, who held that the spiritual influence of Christ is passed on from generation to generation, more or less mechanically, through a rational process of teaching and learning within the communities of believers that make up the Christian church. He holds to a strictly causal, non-mystical theory of historical transmission. The image of Christ is kept alive in the minds and hearts of believers by a process of education. The community transmits Christ from one generation to the next by rigorous teaching and learning. A text like the Bible is important as an object of study and as a source book for orientation, but the understanding and personal integration of its spiritual meaning is strictly dependent upon the effectiveness and the teaching of the community in which one participates as a Christian. The Bible's inspirational power and its spiritual effects on believers do not depend on the working of the Holy Spirit or any other supernatural agents. Ritual was intent on purging theology of its metaphysical baggage and of reliance on the influence of mystical or supernatural elements. To achieve this, he crafted his theological views to harmonize with the positivistic learning theories of the day. In his view, the spiritual reality of Christ, no matter how numinous, is transmitted through the ages strictly by the educational means available to communities of faith who pass their teaching and collective memories on from the earliest generations down to the latest ones, each generation investing these received materials anew with its own human energy. One believes what one learns and receives in the community of faith. There is nothing metaphysical or mystical about this process. It is cognitive behavioral psychology, pure and simple, to put it in today's psychological language. For the theologian Ritchell and others who followed this line of thinking, spiritual transmission has nothing to do with archetypal images and energies or with synchronicity. As a 24-year-old medical student with only a youthful amateur's understanding of theology, for which he apologizes profusely in the introduction, Jung objects vehemently to this theory of transmission of spiritual reality. His objection hinges precisely on the point that Ritchell deletes the mystical element from his theology. The mystery of a metaphysical world, a metaphysical order, 
or the kind that Christ taught and embodied in his own person, must be placed in center stage of the Christian religion, Jung argues. No religion has survived or ever will without mystery to which the devotee is most intimately bound. In describing ritual, quite correctly, as having shorn theology of metaphysical and mystical elements, Jung puts his finger accurately on the basic problem in late 19th century liberal Protestant theology. Jung regards numinous experience of the divine other, in this case Christ, as foundational for a living spiritual tradition. Without the mystical element, religious traditions become sterile, nothing more than the habit-ridden repetitions of learned doctrines. This was, as we now know from his autobiography, his own experience of the Swiss Reformed Church. As he reports in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, this is what he diagnosed to be the source of the spiritual illness of his pastor father, Paul Young. I'm going to skip ahead and just read the last paragraph in this section. Jung could speak, therefore, of the power of numinous archetypal images, energies, and processes emerging within the space and time-limited world as the consequence of synchronistic concatenations in the depths of the collective unconscious, where psyche and matter are one and constitute two sides of a single whole. These occur at moments of significance in the lives of individuals and communities, and they have the effect of enlivening and energizing them with a sense of transcendent meaning. It is these acausal meaningful events that most deeply keep a spiritual tradition alive and vital, and not the rational teachings of texts and techniques that go on within the communities of the committed. They are, in religious terms, signs of the working of the Holy Spirit and the continuous presence of God within the historical process. In other words, Jung concludes that it takes spirit to keep spirit alive. Music